The Adventures of Huck Five. It would be most an hour yet till breakfast, so we left and struck down into the woods, because Tom said we got to have some light to see how to dig by, and a lantern makes too much and might get us into trouble. What we must have was a lot of them rotten chunks that's called foxfire, and just makes a soft kind of a glow when you lay them in a dark place. We fetched an armful and hid it in the weeds, and sat down to rest, and Tom says, kind of dissatisfied, "'Blame it, this whole thing is just as easy and awkward as it can be, and it makes it so rotten difficult to get up a difficult plan. There ain't no watchman to be drugged. Now there ought to be a watchman. There ain't even a dog to give a sleeping mixture to. And there's Jim, chained by one leg with a ten-foot chain to the leg of his bed. Why, all you got to do is lift up the bedstead and slip off the chain. And Uncle Silas, he trusts everybody, sends the key to the pumpkin-headed nigger, and don't send nobody to watch the nigger. Jim could have got out of that window hole before this, only there wouldn't be no use trying to travel with a ten-foot chain on his leg. Why, drat it, Huck, it's the stupidest arrangement I ever see. You got to invent all the difficulties. Well, we can't help it. We got to do the best we can with the materials we got. Anyhow, there's one thing. There's more honor in getting him out through a lot of difficulties and dangers where there weren't one of them furnished to you by the people who it was their duty to furnish them, and you had to contrive them all out of your own head. Now look at just that one thing of the lantern. When you come down to the cold facts, we simply got to let on that a lantern's risky. Why, we could work with a torchlight procession if we wanted to, I believe. Now, whilst I think of it, we got to hunt up something to make a saw out of first chance we get. What do we want of a saw? What do we want of a saw? Ain't we got to saw the leg of Jim's bed off so as to get the chain loose? Why, you just said a body could lift up the bedstead and slip the chain off. Well, if that ain't just like you, Huck Finn, you can get up the infant schooliest ways of going at a thing. Why, hain't you ever read any books at all? Baron Trenck, nor Casanova, nor Benvenuto Cellini, nor Henry the Fourth, nor none of them heroes? Who ever heard of getting a prisoner loose in such a old matey way as that? No. The way all the best authorities does is to saw the bed leg in two, and leave it just so, and swallow the sawdust so it can't be found, and put some dirt and grease around the sawed place so the very keenest seneschal can't see no sign of its being sawed, and thinks the bed leg is perfectly sound. Then, the night you're ready, fetch the leg a kick, down she goes. Slip off your chain, and there you are. Nothing to do but hitch your rope ladder to the battlements, shin down it, break your leg in the moat, because a rope ladder is nineteen foot too short, you know, and there's your horses and your trusty vassals, and they scoop you up and fling you across a saddle, and away you go to your native Languedoc, or Navarre, or wherever it is. It's gaudy, Huck. I wish there was a moat to this cabin. If we get time, the night of the escape, we'll dig one. I says, what do we want of a moat when we're going to snake him out from under the cabin? But he never heard me. He had forgot me and everything else. He had his chin in his hand, thinking. Pretty soon he sighs and shakes his head, then sighs again and says, no, it wouldn't do. There ain't necessity enough for it. For what? I says. Why? to saw Jim's leg off, he says. Good land, I says. Why, there ain't no necessity for it. And what would you want to saw his leg off for, anyway? Well, some of the best authorities has done it. They couldn't get the chain off, so they just cut their hand off and shoved. And a leg would be better still. But we got to let that go. There ain't necessity enough in this case. 
And besides, Jim's a nigger, and wouldn't understand the reasons for it, and how it's the custom in Europe. So we'll let it go. But there's one thing. He can have a rope ladder. We can tear up our sheets and make him a rope ladder easy enough. And we can send it to him in a pie. It's mostly done that way. And I've had worse pies. Why, Tom Sawyer, how you talk, I says. Jim ain't got no use for rope ladder. He has got use for it. How you talk, you better say. You don't know nothing about it. He's got to have a rope ladder. They all do. What in the nation can he do with it? Do with it? He can hide it in his bed, can't he? That's what they all do, and he's got to, too. Huck, you don't ever seem to want to do anything as regular. You want to be starting something fresh all the time. Suppose he don't do nothing with it. Ain't it there in his bed for a clue after he's gone? And don't you reckon they'll want clues? Of course they will. And you wouldn't leave them any? That would be a pretty howdy-do, wouldn't it? I never heard of such a thing. Well, I says, if it's in the regulations and he's got to have it, all right, let him have it, because I don't wish to go back on no regulations. But there's one thing, Tom Sawyer, if we go to tearing up our sheets to make Jim a rope ladder, we're going to get into trouble with Aunt Sally just as sure as you're born. Now the way I look at it, a hickory bark ladder don't cost nothing, and don't waste nothing, and it's just as good to load up a pie with, and hide in a straw tick, as any rag ladder you can start, and as for Jim, he ain't had no experience, and so he don't care what kind of a— Oh, shucks, Huck Finn, if I was as ignorant as you, I'd keep still. That's what I'd do. Who ever heard of a state prisoner escaping by a hickory bark ladder? Why, it's perfectly ridiculous. Well, all right, Tom, fix it your own way, but if you'll take my advice, you'll let me borrow a sheet off of the clothesline. He said that would do, and that gave him another idea, and he says, Borrow a shirt, too. What do we want of a shirt, Tom? Want it for Jim to keep a journal on. Journal your granny. Jim can't write. Suppose he can't write. He can make marks on the shirt, can't he? If we make him a pen out of an old pewter spoon or a piece of old iron barrel hoop. Why, Tom, we can pull a feather out of a goose and make him a better one, and quicker, too. Prisoners don't have geese running round the donjon keep to pull pens out of you muggins. They always make their pens out of the hardest, toughest, troublesomest piece of old brass candlestick or something like that they can get their hands on. And it takes them weeks and weeks and months and months to file it out, too, because they've got to do it by rubbing it on the wall. They wouldn't use a goose quill if they had it. It ain't regular. Well, then, what'll we make him the ink out of? Many makes it out of iron rust and tears, but that's the common sort and women. The best authorities uses their own blood. Jim can do that, and when he wants to send any little common ordinary mysterious message to let the world know where he's captivated, he can write it on the bottom of a tin plate with a fork and throw it out of the window. The Iron Mask always done that, and it's a blame good way, too. Jim ain't got no tin plates. They feed him in a pan. That ain't nothing. We can get him some. Can't nobody read his plates. That ain't got anything to do with it, Huck Finn. All he's got to do is to write on the plate and throw it out. You don't have to be able to read it. Why, half the time you can't read anything a prisoner writes on a tin plate or anywhere else. Well, then, what's the sense in wasting the plates? Why, blame it all, it ain't the prisoner's plates. But it's somebody's plates, ain't it? Well, supposing it is, what does the prisoner care whose? He broke off there because we heard the breakfast horn blowing, so we cleared out for the house. 
Along during the morning I borrowed a sheet and a white shirt off of the clothesline, and I found an old sack and put them in it, and we went down and got the fox fire and put that in, too. I called it borrowing, because that was what Pap always called it. But Tom said it warn't borrowing, it was stealing. He said we was representing prisoners, and prisoners don't care how they get a thing so they get it, and nobody don't blame them for it, either. It ain't no crime in a prisoner to steal the thing he needs to get away with, Tom said. It's his right. And so, as long as we was representing the prisoner, we had a perfect right to steal anything on this place we had the least use for to get ourselves out of prison with. He said if we weren't prisoners it would be a very different thing, and nobody but a mean, ornery person would steal when he weren't a prisoner. So we allowed we would steal everything there was that come handy. And yet he made a mighty fuss one day after that, when I stole a watermelon out of the nigger patch and eat it, and he made me go and give the niggers a dime without telling them what it was for. Tom said that what he meant was, we could steal anything we needed. Well, I says, I needed the watermelon. But he said I didn't need it to get out of prison with. There's where the difference was. He said if I'd a wanted it to hide a knife in and smuggle it to Jim to kill the Seneschal with, it would have been all right. So I let it go at that, though I couldn't see no advantage in my representing a prisoner if I got to set down and chaw over a lot of gold-leaf distinctions like that every time I see a chance to hog a watermelon. Well, as I was saying, we waited that morning till everybody was settled down to business, and nobody in sight around the yard. Then Tom he carried the sack into the lean-to whilst I stood off a piece to keep watch. By and by he come out, and we went and sat down on the woodpile to talk. He says, Everything's all right now except tools, and that's easy fixed. Tools, I says. Yes. Tools for what? Why, to dig with. We ain't a-going to gnaw him out, are we? Ain't them old crippled picks and things in there good enough to dig a nigger out with? I says. He turns on me, looking pitying enough to make a body cry, and says, Huck Finn, did you ever hear of a prisoner having picks and shovels, and all the modern conveniences in his wardrobe to dig himself out with? Now, I want to ask you, if you got any reasonableness in you at all, what kind of a show would that give him to be a hero? Why, they might as well lend him the key and done with it. Picks and shovels, why, they wouldn't furnish them to a king. Well, then, I says, if we don't want the picks and shovels, what do we want? A couple of case knives. To dig the foundations out from under that cabin with? Yes. Confound it, it's foolish, Tom. It don't make no difference how foolish it is. It's the right way, and it's the regular way, and there ain't no other way that ever I heard of, and I've read all the books that gives any information about these things. They always dig out with a case knife, and not through dirt, mind you. Generally it's through solid rock, and it takes them weeks and weeks and weeks, and forever and ever ever. Why, look at one of them prisoners in the bottom dungeon of the Castle Deef, in the harbour of Marseilles, that dug himself out that way. How long was he at it, you reckon? I don't know. Well, guess. I don't know. A month and a half. Thirty-seven year. And he come out in China. That's the kind. I wish the bottom of this fortress was solid rock. Jim don't know nobody in China. What's that got to do with it? Neither did that other fellow. But you're always a wandering off on a side issue. Why can't you stick to the main point? All right, I don't care where he comes out. So he comes out, and Jim don't either, I reckon. But there's one thing anyway. Jim's too old to be dug out with a case knife. He won't last. 
Yes, he will last, too. You don't reckon it's going to take thirty-seven years to dig out through a dirt foundation, do you? How long will it take, Tom? Well, we can't risk being as long as we ought to, because it mayn't take very long for Uncle Silas to hear from down there by New Orleans. He'll hear Jim ain't from there. Then his next move will be to advertise Jim, or something like that. So we can't risk being as long digging him out as we ought to. By rights, I reckon we ought to be a couple of years. But we can't. Things being so uncertain, what I recommend is this. That we really dig right in, and quick as we can, and after that we can let on to ourselves that we was at it thirty-seven years. Then we can snatch him out and rush him away the first time there's an alarm. Yes, I reckon that'll be the best way. Now there's sense in that, I says. Letting on don't cost nothing. Letting on ain't no trouble. And if it's any object, I don't mind letting on we was at it a hundred and fifty year. It wouldn't strain me none after I got my hand in. So I'll moosey along now and smooch a couple of case knives. Smooch three, he says. We want one to make a saw out of. Tom, if it ain't unregular and irreligious to suggest it, I says, there's an old rusty saw blade around yonder sticking under the weatherboard and behind the smokehouse. He looked kind of weary and discouraged like and says, It ain't no use to try to learn you nothing, Huck. Run along and smooch the knives, three of them. So I done it. End of chapter. In chapter 36. As soon as we reckoned everybody was asleep that night, we went down the lightning rod, and shut ourselves up in the lean-to, and got out our pile of fox-fire and went to work. We cleared everything out of the way, about four or five foot along the middle of the bottom log. Tom said we was right behind Jim's bed now, and we'd dig in under it and when we got through there couldn't nobody in the cabin ever know that there was any hole there, because Jim's counterpin hung down most to the ground, and you'd have to raise it up and look under to see the hole. So we dug and dug with the case knives till most midnight, and then we was dog-tired, and our hands was blistered, and yet you couldn't see we'd done anything hardly. At last I says, this ain't no thirty-seven-year job. This is a thirty-eight-year job, Tom Sawyer. He never said nothing. But he sighed, and pretty soon he stopped digging, and then for a good little while I knowed that he was thinking. Then he says, It ain't no use, Huck. It ain't a-going to work. If we was prisoners it would, because then we'd have as many years as we wanted, and no hurry and we wouldn't get but a few minutes to dig every day while they was changing watches, and so our hands wouldn't get blistered, and we could keep it up right along year in and year out, and do it right, and the way it ought to be done. But we can't fool along. We got to rush. We ain't got no time to spare. If we was to put in another night this way, we'd have to knock off for a week to let our hands get well. Couldn't touch a case knife with them sooner. Well, then, what are we going to do, Tom? I'll tell you. It ain't right, and it ain't moral, and I wouldn't like it to get out. But there ain't only just the one way. We got to dig him out with the picks and let on its case knives. Now you're talking, I says. Your head gets leveler and leveler all the time, Tom Sawyer, I says. Picks is the thing, moral or no moral. And as for me, I don't care shucks for the morality of it, nohow. When I start in to steal a nigger, or a watermelon, or a Sunday school book, I ain't no ways particular how it's done, so it's done. What I want is my nigger, or what I want is my watermelon, or what I want is my Sunday school book. And if a pick's the handiest thing, that's the thing I'm a going to dig that nigger, or that watermelon, or that Sunday school book out with. And I don't give a dead rat what the authorities thinks about another. Well, he says, there is excuse for picks and letting on in a case like this. If it weren't so, I wouldn't approve of it. 
nor I wouldn't stand by and see the rules broke, because right is right and wrong is wrong, and a body ain't got no business doing wrong when he ain't ignorant and knows better. It might answer for you to dig Jim out with a pick, without any letting on, because you don't know no better. But it wouldn't for me, because I do know better. Give me a case knife. He had his own by him, but I handed him mine. He flung it down and says, Give me a case knife. I didn't know just what to do, but then I thought. I scratched round amongst the old tools and got a pickaxe and give it to him, and he took it and went to work and never said a word. He was always just that particular, full of principle. So then I got a shovel, and then we picked and shoveled, turned about, and made the fur fly. We stuck to it about a half an hour, which was as long as we could stand up, but we had a good deal of a hole to show for it. When I got upstairs I looked out at the window and see Tom doing his level best with the lightning rod, but he couldn't come it, his hands was so sore. At last he says, "'It ain't no use, it can't be done. What you reckon I better do? Can't you think of no way?' "'Yes,' I says, "'but I reckon it ain't regular. Come up the stairs and let on it's a lightning rod.' So he done it. Next day Tom stole a pewter spoon and a brass candlestick in the house for to make some pens for Jim out of, and six tallow candles and I hung around the nigger cabins and laid for a chance, and stole three tin plates. Tom says it wasn't enough, but I said nobody wouldn't ever see the plates that Jim throwed out, because they'd fall in the dog fennel and jimson weeds under the window hole. Then we could tote them back, and he could use them all over again. So Tom was satisfied. Then he says, Now, the thing to study out is how to get the things to Jim. "'Take them in through the hole,' I says, when we get it done. He only just looked scornful, and said something about nobody ever heard of such an idiotic idea, and then he went to studying. By and by he said he had ciphered out two or three ways, but there wa'n't no need to decide on any of em yet. Said we got to post Jim first. That night we went down the lightning rod a little after ten, and took one of the candles along, and listened under the window hole, and heard Jim snoring. So we pitched it in, and it didn't wake him. Then we whirled in with a pick and shovel. In about two hours and a half, the job was done. We crept in under Jim's bed and into the cabin, and pawed around and found the candle and lit it, and stood over Jim a while, and found him looking hearty and healthy, and then we woke him up gentle and gradual. He was so glad to see us he most cried, and called us Honey, and all the pet names he could think of, and was for having us hunt up a cold chisel to cut the chain off of his leg with right away, and clearing out without losing any time. But Tom, he showed him how unregular it would be, and sat down and told him all about our plans, and how we could alter them in a minute any time there was an alarm, and not to be the least afraid because we would see he got away, sure. So Jim, he said it was all right, and we sat there and talked over old times a while. And then Tom asked a lot of questions, and when Jim told him Uncle Silas come in every day or two to pray with him, and Aunt Sally come in to see if he was comfortable and had plenty to eat, and both of them was kind as they could be, Tom says, Now I know how to fix it. We'll send you some things by them. I said, Don't do nothing of the kind. It's one of the most jackass ideas I ever struck. But he never paid no attention to me. Went right on. It was his way when he got his plans set. So he told Jim how we'd have to smuggle in the rope ladder pie and other large things by Nat, the nigger that fed him, and he must be on the lookout and not be surprised not let Nat see him open them, and we would put small things in Uncle's coat pockets, and he must steal them out, and we would tie things to Aunt's apron strings, or put them in her apron pocket if we got a chance, 
and told him what they would be and what they was for, and told him how to keep a journal on the shirt with his blood and all that. He told him everything. Jim, he couldn't see no sense in the most of it, but he allowed we was white folks and knowed better than him. So he was satisfied and said he would do it all just as Tom said. Jim had plenty corn-cob pipes and tobacco, so we had a right down good sociable time. Then we crawled out through the hole and so home to bed, with hands that looked like they'd been chawed. Tom was in high spirits. He said it was the best fun he ever had in his life, and the most intellectual, and said if we only could see his way to it, we would keep it up all the rest of our lives and leave Jim to our children to get out, for he believed Jim would come to like it better and better the more he got used to it. He said that in that way it could be strung out to as much as eighty year, and would be the best time on record and he said it would make us all celebrated that it had a hand in it. In the morning we went out to the woodpile and chopped up the brass candlestick into handy sizes, and Tom put them and the pewter spoon in his pocket. Then we went to the nigger cabins, and while I got Nat's notice off, Tom shoved a piece of candlestick into the middle of a corn pone that was in Jim's pan, and we went along with Nat to see how it would work and it just worked noble. When Jim bit into it, it most smashed all his teeth out, and there weren't ever anything could have worked better. Tom said so himself. Jim he never let on, but what it was only just a piece of rock or something like that that's always getting into bread, you know. But after that he never bit into nothing but what he jabbed his fork into at three or four places first. And whilst we was a-standin' there in the dimish light, here comes a couple of the hounds bulging in from under Jim's bed, and they kept on piling in till there was eleven of them, and there weren't hardly room in there to get your breath. By jings, we forgot to fasten that lean-to door. The nigger Nat, he only just hollered, Witches! once, and keeled over on to the floor amongst the dogs, and begun to groan like he was dying. Tom jerked the door open and flung out a slab of Jim's meat and the dogs went for it, and in two seconds he was out himself and back again and shut the door, and I knowed he fixed the other door, too. Then he went to work on the nigger, coaxing him and petting him, and asking him if he'd been imagining he saw something again. He raised up and blinked his eyes round and says, "'Mars said you'll say I's a fool.' But if I didn't believe I see most a million dogs or devils or something, I wish I may die right here in these tracks. I did most surely. Ma said I felt em. I felt em, sir. They was all over me. Dad fetch it. I just wished I could get my hands on one of them witches just once. Only just once. That's all I'd ask. But mostly I wish they'd leave me alone. I does. Tom says, "'Well, i tell you what I think. What makes them come here just at this runaway nigger's breakfast time? It's because they're hungry. That's the reason. You make them a witch pie, that's the thing for you to do.' "'But my landmark said, how's I going to make em a witch pie? I don't know how to make it. I ain't ever hearing of such a thing before.' "'Well, then, I'll have to make it myself.' Will you do it, honey? Will you? I worship the ground on your foot. I will. All right. I'll do it, seeing it's you, and you've been good to us and showed us the runaway nigger. But you got to be mighty careful. When we come around, you turn your back, and then whatever we've put in the pan, don't you let on you see it at all. And don't you look when Jim unloads the pan. Something might happen. I don't know what. And above all, don't you handle the witch things. Handle em, Ma said. What is you a talking about? I wouldn't lay the weight of my finger on em. Not for ten hundred thousand billion dollars, I wouldn't. End of chapter. Chapter 37 That was all fixed. So then we went away and went to the rubbish pile in the backyard, 
where they keep the old boots and rags and pieces of bottles, and wore out tin things and all such truck, and scratched around and found an old tin washpan, and stopped up the holes as well as we could to bake the pie in, and took it down cellar and stole it full of flour and started for breakfast. And I found a couple of shingle nails that Tom said would be handy for a prisoner to scrabble his name and sorrows on the dungeon walls with, and dropped one of them in Aunt Sally's apron pocket, which was hanging on a chair, and the other we stuck in the band of Uncle Silas's hat, which was on the bureau, because we heard the children say their pa and ma was going to the runaway nigger's house this morning, and then went to breakfast and Tom dropped the pewter spoon in Uncle Silas's coat pocket, and Aunt Sally wasn't come yet, so we had to wait a little while. And when she come she was hot and red and cross, and couldn't hardly wait for the blessing. And then she went to sluicing out coffee with one hand, and cracking the handiest child's head with her thimble with the other, and says, I've hunted high, and I've hunted low, and it does beat all what has become of your other shirt. My heart fell down amongst my lungs and livers and things, and a hard piece of corn crust started down my throat after it, and got met on the road with a cough, and was shot across the table, and took one of the children in the eye and curled him up like a fishing worm, and let a cry out of him the size of a war-whoop. And Tom, he turned kind of blue around the gills, and all amounted to a considerable state of things for about a quarter of a minute, or as much as that. And I would have sold out for half price if there was a bidder. But after that we was all right again. It was the sudden surprise of it that knocked us so kind of cold. Uncle Silas, he says, It's most uncommon curious. I can't understand it. I know perfectly well I took it off, because— Because you hain't got but one on. Just listen at the man. I know you took it off, and know it by a better way than your wool-gathering memory, too, because it was on the clothesline yesterday. I see it there myself. But it's gone. That's the long and the short of it, and you'll just have to change to a red flannel one till I can get time to make a new one and it'll be the third I've made in two years. It just keeps a body on the jump to keep you in shirts, and whatever you do manage to do with them all is more than I can make out. A body think you would learn to take some sort of care of em at your time of life. I know it, Sally, and I do try all I can, but it oughtn't to be altogether my fault, because— you know, I don't see them nor have nothing to do with them except when they're on me, and I don't believe I've ever lost one of them off of me. Well, it ain't your fault if you haven't, Silas. You'd a done it if you could, I reckon. And the shirt ain't all that's gone, nother. There's a spoon gone, and that ain't all. There was ten, and now there's only nine. The calf got the shirt, I reckon, but the calf never took the spoon— that's certain. Why, what else is gone, Sally? There's six candles gone, that's what. The rats could have got the candles, and I reckon they did. I wonder they don't walk off with the whole place, the way you're always going to stop their holes and don't do it. And if they weren't fools, they'd sleep in your hair, Silas. You'd never find it out, but you can't lay the spoon on the rats, and that I know." Well, Sally, I, I'm in fault, and I acknowledge it. I've been remiss, but I won't let tomorrow go by without stopping up them holes. Oh, I wouldn't hurry. Next year will do. Matilda Angelina Araminta Phelps. Whack comes the thimble, and the child snatches her claws out of the sugar bowl without fooling around any. Just then the nigger woman steps on to the passage and says, Mrs.? There's a sheet gone. A sheet gone? Well, for the land's sake. I'll stop up them holes to-day, says Uncle Silas, looking sorrowful. Oh, do shut up. Suppose the rats took the sheet? Where's it gone, lies? Glad to goodness I ain't no notion, Miss Sally. She was on the clothesline yesterday, but she done gone. 
She ain't dead no more now. I reckon the world is coming to an end. I never see the beat of it in all my born days. A shirt and a sheet and a spoon and six can— Missus, comes a young yaller wench. There's a brass candlestick missing. Clear out from here, you hussy, and I'll take a skillet to you. Well, she was just a boiling. I begun to lay for a chance. I reckon I would sneak out and go for the woods till the weather moderated. She kept a raging right along, running her insurrection all by herself, and everybody else mighty meek and quiet. And at last Uncle Silas, looking kind of foolish, fishes up that spoon out of his pocket. She stopped with her mouth open and her hands up, and as for me, I wished I was in Jerusalem or somewheres. But not long, because she says, "'It's just as I expected. So you had it in your pocket all the time, and like as not you've got the other things there, too. How'd it get there?' "'I, I really don't know, Sally,' he says, kind of apologizing. "'Or you know I would tell. I was a studying over my text in Acts 17 before breakfast, and I reckon I put it in there, not noticing, meaning to put my testament in, and it must be so, because my testament ain't in. But I'll go and see, and if the testament is where I had it, I'll know I didn't put it in, and that will show you that I laid the testament down and took up the spoon, and, oh, for the land's sake, give a body a rest. Go long now, the whole kit and boiling of you, and don't come nigh me again till I've got back my peace of mind. I'd a heard her if she'd a said it to herself, let alone speaking it out, and I'd a got up and obeyed her if I'd a been dead. As we was passing through the settin' room, the old man he took up his hat, and the shingle nail fell out on the floor, and he just merely picked it up and laid it on the mantel shelf and never said nothing, and went out. Tom see him do it, and remembered about the spoon, and says, Well, it ain't no use to send things by him no more. He ain't reliable. Then he says, But he done us a good turn with a spoon anyway, without knowing it, and so we'll go and do him one without him knowing it, stop up his rat holes. There was a noble good lot of them down cellar, and it took us a whole hour, but we done the job tight and good and shipshape. Then we heard steps on the stairs, and blowed out our light and hid, and here comes the old man, with a candle in one hand and a bundle of stuff in the other, looking as absent-minded as year before last. He went a-mooning around, first to one rat-hole, and then another, till he'd been to them all. Then he stood about five minutes, picking tallow drip off of his candle and thinking. Then he turns off slow and dreamy towards the stairs, saying, Well, well, for the life of me, I can't remember when I done it. I could show her now that I want to blame on account of the rats. But never mind. Let it go. I reckon it wouldn't do no good. And so he went on a mumbling upstairs, and then we left. He was a mighty nice old man, and always is. Tom was a good deal bothered about what to do for a spoon, but he said we got to have it. So he took a think. When he had ciphered it out, he told me how we was to do. Then we went and waited around the spoon basket till we see Aunt Sally coming. And then Tom went to counting the spoons and laying them out to one side, and I slid one of them up my sleeve, and Tom says, Why, Aunt Sally, there ain't but nine spoons yet. She says, Go long to your play and don't bother me. I know better. I counted them myself. Well, I've counted them twice, Sandy, and I can't make but nine. She looked out of all patience, but of course she come to count. Anybody would. I declare to gracious there ain't but nine, she says. Why, what in the world? Plague take the things. I'll count em again. So I slipped back the one I had, and when she got done counting, she says, 
Hang the troublesome rubbage. There's ten now. And she looked huffy and bothered both. But Tom says, Why, Auntie, I don't think there's ten. You numbskull, didn't you see me count em? I know, but, well, I'll count em again. So I smooched one, and they come out nine, same as the other time. Well, she was in a tearin' way, just a tremblin' all over she was so mad. But she counted and counted till she got that addled she'd start countin' the basket four spoons sometimes. And so three times they come out right, and three times they come out wrong. Then she grabbed up the basket and slammed it across the house and knocked the cat galley west. And she said clear out and let her have some peace. And if we come botherin' round her again betwixt that and dinner, she'd skin us. So we had the odd spoon and dropped it in her apron pocket while she was a givin' us our sailin' orders. And Jim got it all right, along with her shingle nail, before noon. We was very well satisfied with this business, and Tom allowed it was worth twice the trouble it took, because he said now she couldn't ever count them spoons twice alike again to save her life, and wouldn't believe she'd counted them right if she did, and said that after she'd about counted her head off for the next three days, he judged she'd give it up and offer to kill anybody that wanted her to ever count them any more. So we put the sheet back on the line that night, and stole one out of her closet, and kept on putting it back and stealing it again for a couple of days, till she didn't know how many sheets she had any more, and she didn't care, and weren't a-going to bully-rag the rest of her soul out about it, and wouldn't count them again not to save her life. She'd rather die first. So we was all right now, as to the shirt and the sheet and the spoon and the candles, by the help of the calf and the rats and the mixed-up counting, and as to the candlestick, it warn't no consequence it would blow over by and by. But that pie was a job. We had no end of trouble with that pie. We fixed it up away down in the woods and cooked it there, and we got it done at last, and very satisfactory, too, but not all in one day, and we had to use up three washpans full of flour before we got through, and we got burnt pretty much all over, in places, and eyes put out with the smoke, because, you see, we didn't want nothing but a crust, and we couldn't prop it up right, and she would always cave in. But, of course, we thought of the right way at last, which was to cook the latter two in the pie. So then we laid in with Jim the second night, and tore up the sheet all in little strings, and twisted them together, and long before daylight we had a lovely rope that you could have hung a person with. We let on it took nine months to make it. And in the forenoon we took it down to the woods, but it wouldn't go into the pie. Being made of a whole sheet that way, there was rope enough for forty pies if we'd have wanted them, and plenty left over for soup or sausage or anything you choose. We could have had a whole dinner. But we didn't need it. All we needed was just enough for the pie, and so we throwed the rest away. We didn't cook none of the pies in the washpan, afraid the solder would melt, but Uncle Silas he had a noble brass warming pan which he thought considerable of, because it belonged to one of his ancestors, with a long wooden handle that come over from England with William the Conqueror in the Mayflower, or one of them early ships, and was hid away up garret with a lot of other old pots and things that was valuable, not on account of being any account, because they weren't but on account of them being relics, you know. And we snaked her out private, and took her down there. But she failed on the first pies, because we didn't know how, but she come up smiling on the last one. We took and lined her with dough, and set her in the coals, and loaded her up with rag rope, and put on a dough roof, and shut down the lid, and put hot embers on top, stood off five foot with a long handle, cool and comfortable, and in fifteen minutes she turned out a pie that was a satisfaction to look at. But the person that ate it would want to fetch a couple of kegs of toothpicks along, 
for if that rope ladder wouldn't cramp him down to business, I don't know nothing what I'm talking about, and lay him in enough stomach ache to last him till next time, too. Nat didn't look when we put the witch pie in Jim's pan, and we put the three tin plates in the bottom of the pan under the vittles, and so Jim got everything all right, and as soon as he was by himself he busted into the pie and hid the rope ladder inside of his straw tick, and scratched some marks on the tin plate and throwed it out of the window hole. End of chapter. <laughs>